Father, we honor you, we glorify you this afternoon. Lord Jesus, we thank you for everything that you did for us upon the cross. That upon the cross you paid for our total redemption and you bore upon your own self all our sins, our shortcomings, our diseases. And by your wounds, by your blood, we have not only been forgiven, but we have been healed and set free. And so, Lord, today I ask you to touch our hearts by your word. Equip us, strengthen us, Father, that we may be filled with your Holy Spirit. I ask you to heal those that are sick, do miracles in this place, touch people's hearts and their lives. Lord, for everything you do, we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise because you alone are worthy. In the name of Jesus, amen. Praise God. Just to give you an idea of what we are doing, and I'll tell you, now. this is one of our altar calls. As you can see, uh, all these people coming to receive Jesus, uh, all this, it's only about 1% of this crowd is Christian. And when I say Christian, I mean nominal, traditional Christian. People like Catholics and Presbyterians are not even born again, but 99% are from non-Christian background. So this is another crusade in the same region. And the next picture, this is yet another one in that same region. It's a region where we are going to different towns. And these are small towns. Now you might ask, where do all these people come from? Well, it's because it's by, you know, when the word spreads, people come from as far as six hours away. They rent buses and trucks and fill them with people and, and they come to hear the gospel. And the next picture, uh, okay, this is yet another place, another altar call, and the next one. This is, uh, I, we, you know, we, this is a sensitive area. There's a lot of guerrillas and insurgency, and so we, uh, we were protected by, by soldiers. And the next one is, this is my team uh, who, who work with me there. And I'm, I'm going to be with them in a few days. And the next picture is a little boy, about 13 years old. He was born deaf and mute. And he began to hear and to speak after the Lord touched him. And the next one is a girl about, again, 12, 13 years old, born deaf and mute. And the Lord healed her. She began to hear and to speak. And the next one. This, now, this is interesting. You can read the caption. Uh, you know, the, because this is a very... Uh, backward area. They don't have big hospitals there. And this girl was dying. Her kidneys had shut down. So she had lost her eyesight and her limbs were swollen because of fluid. And her family brought her to the meeting and God healed her. In an instant, her eyesight came back, her limbs came back to normal size, and she was healed. And the next one, this is a little girl who was born paralyzed and she she couldn't even stand. She could just roll on the ground. And this is the first time in her life she got up and began to walk when Jesus touched her. Praise God. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Okay. The next, pic the next picture is, uh, this, now this woman, this is interesting. She was brought in a car. And the car was standing on the right side of the platform about 20, 30 meters away. And suddenly when I began to pray for the crowd, uh, the car door open and this woman came walking and everyone began to shout. I had no idea who she was. Then she came up. Then I was told she was lame. She was blind. She couldn't hear, couldn't speak. She was unresponsive. In fact, she was like a vegetable. The only thing was that her heart was, breath uh, was beating and she was breathing. But otherwise, there was no sign of life in her. And she had been like that a long time and they had brought her in the car. But you know, when Jesus touches people, Something happens. And the Lord touched her in the car and she got up and began to walk and she came up and testified and told us what the Lord had done. And so, so I'm talking to her, asking her, you know, what happened to you? What was wrong with her? And you see the man behind her with his hand up in the air, the gray haired man, and he was shouting and jumping up and down and he was kind of getting on my nerves because I was trying to talk to her. So I said, who are you, sir? She said, and, and you know, there's very few Christians there. So he said, I'm her pastor, I'm her pastor. So it turned out she was a Christian. So, so I said, oh, I'm sorry, pastor. So <laughs> tell, tell her what happened. Then he began to give me the whole story. 
and how and he came from a, a fundamentalist uh, Baptist denomination who don't really believe in anything you know they don't even preach the new birth they don't uh, believe Jesus heals the sick and God really turned everything around for him uh, at that meeting so this was a wonderful miracle and then the next one is uh, this is a, 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 a young, and I've seen this maybe twice or thrice in my entire life. This young man, I think he was 21, 22 years old. It's a kind of demon possession. What happened, he wakes up one morning and he doesn't know who he is, doesn't know his own name, uh, doesn't recognize his family, can't speak. When he opened his mouth, just gibberish came out of his mouth. I mean, he was, his mind was completely gone and they didn't know what was wrong with him. And he was in the crowd and Jesus touched him and suddenly he was normal. So they brought him up on the platform. I talked to him. He was perfectly normal. He knew everybody. I think I've seen this twice or thrice in my life. It's amazing. It's a kind of demon possession. The next one, uh, this is the last picture. Uh, and this is a, a lady who was blind who received her sight. But the reason I have this picture is, you see the man on the left with the microphone. Uh, if you look at his clothes, he's a Roman Catholic priest. And so here we are in this area, and the Catholic priests, they love me. I mean, they, they help us. And they, because we are planting churches, doing crusades, they say, Pastor, you do your church, you do your crusades, plant your Pentecostal churches, we are here to help you. And so they are a huge help to us because, uh, in fact, the very first crusade I did in that area, uh, one day, you know, when my team was preparing everything on the field, a couple of days before the crusade, a car drove up and a man jumped out. He said, I'm a Catholic priest and I'm born again. And I was praying. I live about two hours away and the Lord told me to come here. Uh, uh, and he said that you need my help. How can I help you? So my team said, sir, we, because you know, you, when people come, you need people to do crowd control and you know, keep order. And we had nobody since it was an untouched area. So we, we said we need some people. So he came with two busloads of young adults and the, you know between 18 and 25 I mean about 120 people so my team told them where to stand what to do and they did everything very well until I began to pray for the sick when the miracles began to happen they freaked out they went on their knees pulled out their rosaries and they were doing the Hail Marys I mean they were they didn't <laughs> they were so frightened they had no idea what was going on so I told my guys I told my team, just take them aside, calm them down, and tell them this is not of the devil, you know. So, so, uh, so I say important thing is that we, we forgot that they were not even born again, you know. So anyway, my team preached to them, did an altar call, they were all born again. And the next night, which was the last night, they all got baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, so we ended up very well. So this is just to give you an idea. And uh, then, of course, we are working in Africa. We... So we do about four crusades in Asia, and, uh, and then we do eight campaigns in Africa every year. And we see, you know, the only true bookkeeping of souls is in heaven, but we see approximately a million people, plus minus, who respond to the altar call every year. And during COVID, the first year of COVID, uh, 2020, uh, I could not do any crusades anywhere because the whole world was shut down. But uh, 2021, I found out that Tanzania was still open, and which was interesting uh, because when COVID came, uh, you know, and so people were dying, especially country with an elderly population, they suffered the most. Uh, and the two countries that were hit the most in Europe were Italy and Spain because they had a large uh, elderly population. So people were dying. And so what happened was uh, Africa, all the countries shut down. And this president, he, 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 say, he came on the radio and TV, and he was a Christian. And he said that if these rich Western countries cannot handle it, how will we in Africa handle this? So he says, I'm shutting down the country. Everything will be shut down, except the churches will be open. I want everyone to go to church and fast and pray for a week. So for a whole week, the whole country, I mean, you know, they were fasting and praying. Everything was shut down after, except the churches. At the end of the week, he came on national TV and radio. He says, well, we have prayed, and I believe God has heard us, so I declare the nation clean. And then he opened everything up. 
And so I found out that Tanzania was open. So I went there and I was so curious because everywhere else people were dying of COVID. So I talked to some missionaries and doctors because they're the best people to talk to. Medical doctors, you know, senior physicians in hospitals. And they say, well, we do have COVID, but it's so rare. You run into a case now and then, but generally there's nothing. So I did crusades like this, crowds and... Uh, Everything was good. We didn't have any issues. So we did that for a whole year. We did crusades in Tanzania. We went all over the country preaching the gospel. People were saved. People were healed. It, it was great. We had a great time, 2021. And then, of course, 2022, the other African countries opened up. We went to uh, Zambia. And, and, you know, and, uh, and, but Asia has still been closed. So this is my first time coming back after three years uh, to Asian countries. So please do keep us in prayer, amen? Because it is harvest time and we must uh, win as many souls as possible because I feel like, you know, COVID really robbed us of three years of harvest. That's how I, I look at it, you know, three years of harvest. So we must uh, continue to make efforts to win as many souls as we can because you see, at the end of the day, there's only one thing that really matters. And that is, when a person dies, did he live and die with or without Jesus? Everything else doesn't really matter from the perspective of eternity. You know, there are other things that are important, but from the perspective of eternity, there's only one person, one thing that's important, whether a person, whether a person lived and died with or without Jesus. And that is why we must preach the gospel. And then even for you and me, uh, you know, I have a house, I have a car and all those things, but I'm very aware that the only thing I can take with me to heaven are the people I win for Jesus. That's the only thing from this earth that I can take with me. So let us be mindful of it and win souls, as the brother leading the worship was saying. Let us be mindful of this and let us win souls and share Christ with as many people as we can in our personal lives. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Okay, thank you very much for showing these pictures. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 4. It says, um, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, I, you have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Uh, and he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Amen. So we know that these were the last words that Jesus spoke on this earth. Because when he finished saying this, he was taken up to heaven. And that's what makes these words very significant. Because these were the last words that Jesus spoke on this earth before he went to heaven. So it says they were gathered together. And then he said something to them in verse 4. He said, he commanded them. He actually gave them a command. And, you know, Jesus gave other commands. He says, one is the commandment, we must love one, love one another. That was, that's one commandment of Jesus, uh, the commandment to love. There's another commandment, that is, we shall love the Lord our God with all our hearts, all our souls, mind, and we shall you know, love our neighbors ourselves, so you have those commandments. But this is the last command that Jesus gave his church. And he said, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So, the last commandment of Jesus was 
He said, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait until you receive that which the Father has promised, which I have told you about. Because John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost. So to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, with the speaking of other tongues, is not a suggestion, but it is a commandment of Jesus. Do you see that? Because many people say, well, salvation is important, but this business with speaking in tongues is not important. It is optional. If you want it, you can have it, but if you don't want it, it's still okay. It's not okay. The reason it's not okay, because Jesus gave it as a command. He commanded them to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He didn't say, well, take it or leave it. You know, if you feel like it, take it. If you don't feel like it, you know, if you feel stupid speaking in tongues in front of people, don't take it. He didn't say that. He gave them a command. So to be baptized with the Holy Ghost, with the speaking of other tongues, is a direct command of Jesus. So then when he said that, it was interesting. I found it very interesting to see the response of the disciples, what they said. It says in verse 6, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, <coughs> Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? You know, I've been a Christian for 47 years and all these years, every time I'd read the scripture, you know, Jesus commanded them to baptize the Holy Spirit and the disciples saying, okay, is that when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And I always used to wonder, what does the restoration of the kingdom to Israel, of Israel have to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What were they thinking? What was their frame of reference? Because I found this response very unusual Jesus talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they say, okay, is that when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And I didn't understand it until a couple of years ago when I began to study history, church history and the history of the times of Jesus. And I want to share something that I learned with you that really gave me clarity and helped me understand. You see, when Jesus came to the scene and began to preach, the kingdom of the Israelites didn't have their own kingdom. They had lived under foreign occupation for a little bit less than 400 years. For almost four centuries, the Israelites had lived under foreign occupation. Now, the people of Israel, they always had their own kingdom. They had their own kings and they were a proud nation. And they had reasons to be proud. One of the reasons was that they understood their uniqueness. There was no other nation like them. They were in covenant with God himself. So they were proud of that. We are better than all the nations on the earth because we are the only nation that's in covenant with God. The second thing is that all the prophets that God sent came from Israel. The law of God was given to Israel. So, you know, so they were a proud people. And now for four centuries, they haven't had their own kingdom, but they lived under foreign occupation. They were more or less slaves. And then if you study history, you will see the first country, first nation to occupy them and to oppress them were the Babylonians. And when the Babylonians left, then came the Seleucid Greeks and the Greeks came and occupied them. And then after the Greeks came the Romans. Now, the interesting thing was that uh, the Greeks... Uh, you know, wherever the Greeks went, if you study Greek history, wherever they went, they left behind, uh, you know, they had a very rich cultural heritage. So the Greeks used to leave a strong cultural and linguistic uh, footprint everywhere they went. So that the, the Greek way of thinking and the Greek language kind of became integrated into you know, in, into the way the Israelites did everything. So just imagine when the first books of the New Testament were written, the Greeks had been gone for over a century, over a hundred years they had been gone. But, and then the language that the people spoke in their everyday, uh, everyday lives was Aramaic, but their, their religious language was Hebrew, still when they wrote down the books of the New Testament, they wrote them in classical Greek. Such was the linguistic 
you know, uh, footprint that the Greeks left behind. So anyway, so then the Greeks left and after the Greeks came the Romans and the Romans had been around for quite some time and that's when Jesus came to the scene. So during these four centuries, well, almost four centuries of oppression, uh, there had been many, many uprisings. The, you know, there had been um, um, Jewish men who had risen up to fight their oppressors, to set their nation free. But all these uprisings had been crushed very brutally. There was one man, he had some limited success, and his name was Judas Maccabeus. So Judas Maccabeus, even today, he's considered a folk hero in Israel, the Maccabees, you know, the followers of Mac this, like the big football team called the Maccabees, you know, he's a folk hero. And he, Judas Maccabeus, he managed to liberate a chunk of territory and establish a Jewish kingdom called the Hasmonean kingdom. And his brother was the first king of the Hasmonean kingdom. But that lasted a few de decades because when the Romans came, they destroyed everything. So here comes Jesus into this situation. And so they had all these uprisings that had failed. But the interesting thing, if you, I'm just trying to give you a background so you understand what's going on here, that you know how people tend to interpret scriptures through the prism of their circumstances and their experiences. So during these four centuries of occupation, uh, the, 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 the Israelites had begun to interpret all the messianic scriptures like the Messiah would be a military figure. He would come and liberate them because they saw all the scriptures, you know, that the Messiah will come and he will establish, his, you know, the kingdom will be forever and all that. So that's why, you know, they, they were waiting for a strong man, a Messiah who would come and deliver them and throw the Romans out and set them free because that's how they interpreted the scriptures. And into this situation comes Jesus. So now Jesus comes and he begins to preach and minister and there were, there were two things about Jesus that really stood out that were unique. The first thing is that the Bible says that he spoke as no man had spoken. There was power in his word and people who listened to him, they were totally caught by his words and people followed him. They wanted to hear him preach. The other thing about Jesus that was unique was that he had miracles. He had the power of God. Wherever he went, the lame walked, the blind saw, the deaf heard, the, you know, I mean, the crippled people walk and even dead people were raised up. Nobody had ever seen anything like this. So as he went everywhere, so you had these people following him around. And among those people who followed him was a group called the Zealots. In fact, one of the Zealots, Simon the Zealot, was one of his disciples. And the Zealots were the insurgent movement. You know, they're the ones who wanted to fight the Romans. So he had all these people. And what was happening was that people began to look at him. He is the perfect candidate. He's the one who's going to deliver us. He's the one who's going to set us free. He's going to lead us against the Romans because he has the power of God. He has miracles happening. So after, if you remember the miracle called the feeding of the 5,000, immediately after that, the Bible says that they tried to make him their king by force. But Jesus was not interested in becoming their king. And they said, no, no, you are the guy. I mean, there is no one else. You are our man. But he refused to become their king. Not only that, but he seemed to be totally oblivious to what was going on around him. People were complaining about taxes and people were being executed and he never criticized the Romans. He never, he seemed to be totally ignorant of what was going on. In fact, what he did, he, he preached about his father. He preached about heaven, about the kingdom of heaven, about the kingdom of God. I mean, he spoke at a totally different level. He never made one single political statement. In fact, the only time he ever came close to making a political statement was when they said, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And he said, give me a coin and took the coin. He said, whose picture is on this coin? Caesar, well, you give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God. End of story. And then what happened? So these people, you can imagine their frustration. 
and he is the one who is going to deliver them. They went so far that when he, uh, just before he was crucified in the last week, week of the Passover, he came to Jerusalem riding on a donkey and they were openly proclaiming him their king. Hosanna is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, which was treason in the eyes of the Romans. But he did that. And then what does Jesus do? He goes and dies on the cross. And when he dies on the cross, all their dreams and aspirations die with him. But Jesus made the ultimate comeback. I mean, you talk about people making a comeback. Jesus made the ultimate comeback because after three days, he rose up again from the dead. And when he rose up from the dead, they begin, their dreams are also resurrected with him. And they begin to follow him around. And they followed him around for 40 days. The Bible says he talked to them about things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And then, they, but they, their dream was still there. They were saying, he, sooner or later he's going to get it. He's going to understand. And now comes the last day. And he says, okay, boys, come together. Let me tell you something. He says, you know what's going to happen now? He says, don't go anywhere but wait in Jerusalem until you receive that which the Father has promised that we have spoken about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they thought, now he gets it. So said, oh, is that when you, <laughs> because he's going to do it. Is that when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Do you get it? And, and what he did, he dashed their hopes to the ground for the last time by saying, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has appointed, but the Holy Ghost is going to come. Okay? The Holy Ghost is going to come. Now, let me pause here a little bit because Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost you know, Jesus ascended to heaven, Holy Ghost came. Life in Israel went on as before. Romans were still there. People were still being oppressed, all that. For 35 more years, uh, for about, no, 70 more years. Then the, no, sorry, 35 more years. Year 70, 80. The Israelites, had, Israelites, somebody else, you know, came up and led one last uprising. And by that time, the Romans had enough of the Jews and their uprisings. They sent their general called Titus, who was known for his exceptional brutality. Titus came from Rome with his legions, and he set about destroying everything and killing as many Jews as he killed, as he could. He killed thousands of people. Titus killed thousands of people. He reduced the city of Jerusalem to rubble. He did such a thorough job of it that even today, if you go to Israel, archaeologists are still digging through the rubble, trying to find out where those different buildings are that are mentioned in the Bible. Destroyed the city. And then the Jews were scattered for almost 2,000 years. And then they came back in 1948. And even then, only two of the ten tribes come, came back. So... I want to say this, I had to mention this because you might ask, what about the Jews? Well, they're the people of the future. After the church is raptured, the Jews will carry the witness of Jesus because the Bible says they shall see the one who they have pierced. And that's when they shall get a revelation of Jesus. But now, today, this moment is the day of the church. On the day of Pentecost, the church was born. And this church, the interesting thing about the church is that the church of Jesus is the mightiest nation on this earth. We don't have a national flag. We don't have a, a seat in the United Nations. But wherever the gospel goes, when people give their lives to Jesus, their allegiance to him is so strong and powerful. That's why places like North Korea, you know, and other countries where they have dictators and despots, if there is anything they fear, it is that the church will come into their nation because people will be set free from bondage. 
But anyway, let's go back to the narrative. Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has decided. But he said, but the Holy Spirit is going to come. Now, who is this Holy Spirit? He said, the Holy Spirit is going to come. Now, the Holy Spirit, as you all know, is the third person of the Trinity, right? Now, we, some, when he, if you ask people about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, people generally think this way, that the Father is this old man with a big beard, on a throne in heaven with a permanent frown on his forehead because he's looking at us and he's pretty much fed up of you and me. Fed up of all our, all our antics and he's mad. In fact, there are, there are these sermons, you know, great sermons about sinners in the hands of an angry God. We have an angry God. So that's the Father. And Jesus, Jesus is nice. All our songs, Jesus loves me, you know, because he's been here, he's one of us, and all the pictures of Jesus, he's just really, really nice guy. He loves the children, he loves us. It doesn't matter what we do, he can't stop loving us, he can't help but being nice. Jesus, we, 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 ident we understand him, identify him. Holy Spirit, who is he? Well, no one can really put a finger on him because he, he just shows up, you know. <laughs> he's the shapeless thing, and he, he can show up in church and then Sunday morning, you know, Holy Spirit shows up and you feel the, whoo, crew, you feel that, whoo, man, I, I, feel, I feel the heebie-jeebies, you know, and you go, whoo, rababa, whoo, Holy Ghost. And then you go home feeling good and you say, man, that was good. I wish we experienced the same thing next Sunday. So you come next Sunday and you're waiting for the Holy Ghost to show up, you know. But now, when we say the Holy Spirit is the third part of, third part, person of the Trinity, we don't mean that he's like the junior part, you know. The Father is number one, Jesus is number two, the shapeless Holy Spirit is number three. No, there is one God, but he has revealed himself as three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are three persons of the same person. The Holy Spirit is as much God as Jesus or the Father. They're co-equal. Do you understand what I'm saying? Just like the Father can speak to you, Jesus, Holy Spirit. But here's the difference. The difference is this. That the Father is in heaven on the throne. Jesus, he came here and he went back and he's at the right hand of the Father. But the Holy Spirit is here. The Father is on the throne. If you were to ask me geographically, where, where is the Father? Well, he's on the throne in heaven. If you were to ask me, where is Jesus right now? He's at the right hand of the Father. But the Holy Spirit is here. So everything that the Father and the Son say or do, they do so through the Holy Spirit. So when I say Jesus lives in me, he lives in me through the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? The Holy Spirit, that's why our personal relationship with the Holy Spirit is of utmost importance because everything that the Father and the Son speak or do in our lives or in the church, they do so through the Holy Spirit. So our relationship with the Holy Spirit, our communion with the Holy Spirit are of utmost importance. That's why Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, in other words, the Holy Spirit is going to come. Now, he's been around for 2,000 years because Jesus said these, word 2000, these words 2,000 years ago. He says, when the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. Now, then he makes it personal. Not only is the Holy Spirit going to come, but he's going, he's going to come upon you. So I want to challenge you and ask you, what is the depth of your surrender to the Holy Spirit? Has he come upon you? You who are sitting here, and I challenge myself, has the Holy Spirit, we know he's around, but has he come upon you? How, how much of yourself have you surrendered to the Holy Spirit? So it's not really a question of how much of the Holy Spirit do I have, but it's a question of how much of me does the Holy Spirit have? Are you with me? 
It becomes very, very personal. The Holy Spirit shall come upon you. So you who are here, has the Holy Spirit come upon you? Or is he just around you when you're in church? You can feel him, but has he come upon you? And if he has come, does he have total room in your life? When the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, the first thing he said that shall happen, you shall receive power. And that word power is the Greek word dynamis. And dynamis in today's language would mean brute force, the miracle working power of God. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost shall come upon you. And that word power, dynamis, is the same word used in Mark chapter 5. When you remember when the woman with the issue of blood came and touched Jesus. And Jesus said, somebody touch me because I felt virtue go from me. That word virtue is the same word. And then it says, wherever he went, people wanted to touch his garment. Because dunamis was flowing from him. And everybody was, would, who touched him was healed. So Jesus is saying something very interesting, something very radical. He says, when the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, the same divine substance that flowed from me and healed all those people shall flow from you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, that same divine substance that flowed from me and healed that woman with the issue of blood, it shall flow from you. Now, you might say, well, I don't see that happening in my life. Why? Let me, do you want to know the reason? Because our expectations do not rise to the level of God's promises. We must literally take God's word in faith and then act on that word. Amen. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. You shall cast out devils. Now, devils won't come out until you actually cast them out. You shall lay your hands upon the sick and they shall recover. If you do not lay your hands upon the sick, I can promise you they will not get healed. We, our expectations from God have to rise to the level of his promises. So we have to say, God, this is what you have said in your word. And I believe it. I take it by faith. Now I'm going to do the things that you have said I shall do. And I believe that when I lay my hands upon the sick in the name of Jesus, they shall recover. Healing the sick is a great tool in evangelism. You know, just before COVID, um, I lived in Sweden for 20 years. My wife is from Sweden. So I was back in Sweden. I was going to a shopping mall and I heard a voice behind me uh, say, Brother Christopher. And I turned around and he was this guy. I said, excuse me, do I know you? And he was he looked like an immigrant like me. And he said, Brother, I'm Kusro from Iran. I said, oh, yeah, I remember you. How are you doing? This was a guy who I used to, 1980, 81, I used to go to the student housing at the university and, and witness to people. And so I came to this guy's place and, and boy, he was so intelligent. He was so smart. And uh, whatever I said, he had three arguments against it. He talked circles around me. After 20 minutes, I was looking for an exit strategy so I could leave him with my pride still intact, you know? Because have you ever met someone like that who's smarter than you, try to witness to him, and he just talks circles around you, and then, and then you just want to get out of there, you know, find someone else to talk to him. And so, I, but then I thought, oh my Lord, I said, I should, I should get out of it. I don't know how to talk to this guy. He's smart, he was smart. And then suddenly, he was, you know, he's sitting on the chair. I said, what's wrong with you? He said, well, I'm crippled. I was born with this disease, and I'm going to have all these surgeries and all that. That's when I saw my opportunity. <laughs> I pounced upon it. I said, okay. I said, let me do this. If I lay my hands upon you in the name of Jesus, and Jesus Christ heals you, will you believe in him? He said, oh, yeah, of course. I laid hands on him. 
in the name of Jesus. And I left. A week later, another of my friends visited him and came to me and said, he's walking, he's healed, he's okay. And it was this guy I was meeting in the mall. So I said, so what are you doing these days? He said, you know, after I got healed, I got saved, and now I'm the leadership in such and such church, and my son is also serving the church. My whole family is serving the Lord. Amen. Amen. Healing. I mean, God heals people because of his compassion for them. God hates diseases because sickness and disease is not from God. There's different ways of looking at, at it, but there's one thing about healing the sick. It's an incredible tool for witnessing, for soul winning. Because anyone can do it. That's the thing. You may not be smart enough to discuss something. You know, Singaporeans are high achievers, too smart for their own good. <laughs> and you talk to him, and the guy has all these arguments. But you know what? There's one way you can beat that. Healing the sick. Are you sick? Yeah, okay, let me pray for you. Anyone, can. you don't need to have as high an education as that guy. You just have to have faith in God. Miracles are a great tool of evangelism. Believe me, and it works. Now, so when I tell this story, you know, this Iranian guy got healed, and uh, Swedish people are like that, you know, so full of unbelief. And the guy said, so, but isn't that dangerous to do? I said, why? What if the guy didn't get healed? I said, what do you mean he didn't get healed? He did get healed, did he? So what are you talking about what if he didn't get healed? He did get healed. What do you mean what if? There's no what ifs. <laughs> if God has healed someone, he has healed someone. You can't go back and say, what if he didn't get healed? I don't even think of the what ifs. I believe in the word of God. Amen. So it's in my name you shall heal the sick. Lay your hands upon the sick, they shall recover. So he says, you shall receive power. You, when the Holy Ghost comes on you, you shall receive the power of God. And then he tells us why we shall receive the power of God. So that you can be my witnesses. That is the reason we have been giving that, given that power. Not so that I can have a healing ministry, but so that I can be a witness for Jesus. And a witness is somebody who can give evidence in court. That's what the word actually means. I remember many, many years ago, I once witnessed a crime uh, being committed and I was there, the police came and they saw me, took my name and address and I received a summons two weeks later. I was summoned to the court and the guy, the criminal was there, many other people were there. I was there soon. I, I, I had to stand up and I was sworn in and the first question they asked me, were you there? I, if I said, no, I wasn't there, I read about it in the newspaper then you're not a good witness. A good witness is somebody who has experienced something. And I'm a witness for Jesus because Jesus has changed my life and I have seen Jesus change the lives of other people. I have been healed myself. I've seen Jesus heal other people. So I'm a witness. I can give evidence that this Jesus Christ is not a figment of somebody's imagination, but he's the son of God and he is risen from the dead and he He's alive. Yeah. Amen. Amen. If I say Jesus is alive, but I act as if he was dead, I'm not a witness. I'm a witness of the risen Christ. Hallelujah. You shall be my witnesses. And then it tells us where we shall be witnesses. He said in Jerusalem, which was their home turf. That's where they lived. In Judea. Judea was the greater territory where the Jews lived. And then in Samaria, the Samaritans, they were the enemy. These were people who had another God. They worship, well, they had another religion. Remember when Jesus went to Samaria and the woman said, why are you even talking to me? Your people, my people have no dealings with one another. You worship in Jerusalem, we worship on this mountain. But Jesus went there to Samaria and he told us to go there. People who have another religion. And then he said, to the ends of the earth. Hallelujah. The ends of the earth. Amen. You know, I've been to the ends of the earth. First place I went to, I, I remember I was in Jakarta and the pastor said, Pastor, tomorrow we are going to a place where it's called the ends of the earth. 
I said, really? He said, yeah, pack your suitcase. We're going there for three days doing a crusade. So I said, where is this place? They said, we are going to fly to Jayapura in Irian Jaya. It's six and a half hours flight from Jakarta, and you're still in Indonesia. So we flew to Jayapura, from Jayapura, and they, they were telling me on the, on the plane, they said, when you go to the interior, there's no roads. You can only fly by small planes and helicopters. And so we were on this small plane flying to a place called Wamena, where the crusade was being held. And they said, then they began to tell me, he says, he says, these people don't be shocked because they don't wear any clothes. They walk around completely nude. I couldn't even imagine. I said, don't the mosquitoes bite them? Because that was my first thought. <laughs> and he said, no, no, no. They smear themselves with pig fat. Ooh, OK. I said, if I was a mosquito, I'd stay away. <laughs> then they said, they walk around completely naked. And then he said, in the interior, they're cannibals cannibals and you're taking me there <laughs> and the pastor said no no you are safe why am I safe he said they prefer to eat white people <laughs> I said hallelujah thank God I'm brown I'm superior to the white man so I came we landed in Wamena and we were waiting for our luggage to come out of that smaller plane and in walks a guy, completely naked. <laughs> Except he's wearing Ray-Ban sunglasses. <laughs> and he has a New York Yankees baseball cap. <laughs> and he's drinking a Diet Coke. <laughs> and I said to my friends, I said, isn't it sad that American culture has come to this place <laughs> before the gospel. <laughs> Baseball caps, Ray-Bans, Diet Cokes, but they walk around naked, they know nothing about Jesus. Anyway, and I'm, I didn't make this up, this is a true story. I, had, I have a picture taken with some of them. I put it on Facebook, <laughs> so me and four of them, and I put it, and the caption was, I'm the one with the pants. So, <laughs> anyway, let me finish. Brother Ken, can I have five more minutes? Let me finish with another story. I went to another place which could be considered the ends of the earth, and that was Burma. I'm not talking about now, but many years ago, military dictatorship, the country was shut. But God opened the door for me to be there. There was strong persecution of Christians. It was bad. And uh, so here I am in Burma. I preach the gospel. Many people in the city of Rangoon, the capital, people were saved, people were healed. And immediately after that, there was persecution. And uh, they arrested, they tortured pastors. It was bad. So I then... Um, after my meetings are over, I left home, and they sent me a message. They said, Pastor, we want you back, but don't come for a year because it's very bad, but you can come back after a year. I said, okay. So a year later, I was back. So I was back. At, we were in a meeting, and we were worshiping God, our little group, and then suddenly the Spirit of God came, and I lay on the floor, and I saw an open vision. Now, an open vision is when you're wide awake, like I'm wide awake, standing here, I can see you, right? And suddenly you disappear, and God shows me that vision, and that vision becomes as real to me as you are, but I can't see you, I just see the vision. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's an open vision. Suddenly I saw an open vision, and anyway, I'd never had an open vision in my life, but I had... Uh, three long open visions in five days. And uh, in one of the open visions, on the third open vision, God began to speak to me. 
And he said, I want you to come back to this country and preach like you do in Africa and plant churches. I said, Lord, it's a great idea and it needs to be done, but I'm not your man. Can find somebody else. And the Lord said, why? I said, because I like my life. I don't want to be tortured and beaten up. I said, there are other preachers who enjoy being tortured because they write books about them. They are gluttons for punishment and they write books about how they've been persecuted. They seem to enjoy it. Why don't you find one of them? Why send me? I've got a wife and three kids and I'm living a good life and I don't like this. And then the Lord said, do you remember what you said to me in the summer of 1977? And I suddenly remember what had happened. I had spent, I got saved in 75. I was in prison in 76, almost the whole year. And 77, I was in Belgium. I was a refugee. And then I was at this conference, organization called Operation Mobilization. And our leader, George Verber, was like on fire for God. So he, he, he saw me. Somebody introduced me to him. And because... You know, I'd been in prison for my faith and all that. He took a personal interest in me. And he used to preach hard. I mean, he said, you must lay down your life for Jesus. You must make your life count. So he really challenged us. So he gave me a book. He said, I want you to read this book. It was called The Calvary Road. I began to read The Calvary Road. After this first chapter, I was weeping. I was on my knees. I finished the book. Then I, when I wanted to give it back to him, he said, no, no, I've got another book. I want you to read. It was called, Come, Live, and Die. <laughs> when I saw Come, Live, and Die, I said, oh, Lord, I know what you're doing to me. So when I read Come, Live, and Die, I was like, ready. I said, God, send me somewhere where I can get killed preaching. <laughs> so I'm in a meeting one day, and George, you know, he's preaches hard, you know, must lay down your life. If you're not willing to die for Jesus, you're useless, you know, something like that. And so he gave an altar call. Those of you who want to lay down your life for the gospel, you know, I was a young guy and I was so stupid. I, <laughs> I did something I regret to this day. I ran to the front and went on my knees and with tears flowing down my cheeks, I said, Lord, send me wherever you want me to go. Send me, even if I get killed, I don't care. In fact, if you don't use me, you can kill me right now. I was ready to die, and I meant every word. I was radical. I came to Sweden, and I'm, my plan was, I'm going to live single, have no family, and I'm going to die preaching somewhere. And then I met this girl in church. <laughs> We've been married 43 years. I looked at her, my knees were shaking. I got married, three children ministering, living a good life. And now the Lord says, remember what you said in 1977? <laughs> I said, Lord, I said, Lord, young people, when they're young, <laughs> we all do stupid things. We all say stupid things, and which we regret later on. And this is my stupid moment. I, I really regret what I said. And the Lord said, well, when you preach, you tell people to hold me to my word. So why can't I hold you to your word? I said, okay, you win. Fine. So I said, I will go to Burma. I will go. I will preach. I, I will do that. I said, but one condition. I want the Holy Ghost to go with me. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, fine. I said, but not the Holy Ghost of the American churches where you line people up and then, you know, you, you give them a little nudge on the forehead and if they don't fall, they do a courtesy drop. Uh, and I said, no, no, not that. Not that whole, I mean, in a place where they kill and they torture people, you don't need, I don't need that Holy Ghost. That is good in Sweden and America and Europe, but I want the Book of Acts Holy Ghost. The Book of Acts, and the Lord said, okay. So next year I'm back in Burma. First crusade. 
I'm preaching, do the altar call, all these people, you know, getting saved, praying for the sick. And for some reason, all the sick, instead of coming to the front, they were all on the side and they were, you know, letting them go. And so as I'm praying for the sick, out of the corner of my eye, I notice a man, he's wearing these striped hospital pajamas. There's two people, three people holding him up and two people with his IV bottles. You know, the intravenous fluids bottles with tubes running into them. And his man looked like death. He looked like a skeleton, skin and bones. And I'm wondering, who is he? What's he? I, later on, I found out he was terminally, terminally ill in hospital. He was dying and his family had brought him to the meeting. So while I'm praying for the sick, suddenly this guy just slides to the floor. And he lays there with his mouth open, with his eyes wide open, and they shout something. Very few people spoke English. And there was a group of doctors and nurses, I don't know, eight or ten of them. They jumped to their feet, ran there, and they began to work on this guy. And everyone is watching them, you know. And then one of the doctors spoke English, and he turned to me and he shouted so everyone could hear. He said, Pastor, he is dead. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my goodness. Nobody should die in a Pentecostal meeting. <laughs> and then my second thought was, okay, okay, so he's dead there, so <laughs> let him lay dead, and I'm going to pray for the sick here, and the meeting is over, you know, and they'll, you know, we'll end the meeting, and there's so many people here, they'll remove the body and all that. But, but while I'm thinking, I'm trying to figure this out, how I'll handle this, suddenly one of the ushers, you know, the doctors went back to their seats. One of the ushers, he grabs the dead man and drags him across the floor <laughs> and puts him right in front of me. And I said, dear Lord, what do I do now? And now he's here in front of me. And then I realized when I went to Rama Bible Training Center, they never taught me how to raise the dead. <laughs> uh, I learned a lot of things, but I didn't know how to deal with this. And I don't know, I didn't know I was, I couldn't call anyone, you know, and find out, brother, help me, what should I do? I didn't know what to do. I really, really didn't know what to do, and I was perplexed, but I said, something has to happen. I can't just, and then suddenly, I saw the face of Pastor Harold Groves. Pastor Harold Groves was a, was an old man. If he was alive today, he would be 130 years old. I met him when I was a young guy and he was like 90 years old. He was an old Englishman and he knew Smith Wigglesworth and, and some of these, you know, old man. He was a man of power. And I remember uh, sitting in his house and, you know, he used to preach to me. And I, he, I remember when he sat in front, he leaned forward and put his finger on my face. And he said, brother, remember when you don't know what to do, the Holy Spirit always knows. And at that moment, I could see Brother Grove's face and his long finger wagging right in front of me. <laughs> Remember, when you don't know what to do, the Holy Ghost knows. And then I said, okay, the Holy Ghost knows. I don't know what to do. So this is what I decided. I took, I, I knew I'm going to make a fool of myself, but if I'm going to do, I might as well do it. I put the microphone to my mouth and I began to say, My interpreter said, what was that, Pastor? I said, I don't have the foggiest idea, but just stay with me. And then I launched into speaking in tongues and I decided I'm going to shout in tongues until something happens. Because now the Holy Ghost is going to do it. And so I went, Nobody moved. Every step, everyone was still there looking at me. And I went, 20 minutes went, nothing happened. I looked at the man, he's still there. After about half an hour, 
I felt, I felt this heat in my body. And then I knew something's going to happen now. So I just shifted gears and I started shouting even louder. After about 45 minutes. Suddenly, you know, by the time my eyes are closed, I'm going, suddenly, suddenly I hear a shout, hallelujah. And I open my eyes and it's the dead man. He's standing right in front of me with his hands in the air and he's shouting and praising God. That man had been risen from, raised from the dead. You know, I still don't understand enough. I could never preach a sermon and tell you how to raise the dead. <laughs> I just know that God did it. Amen. Well, that was all I needed. From there, I went all over Burma. And in the subsequent years, we saw at least four people raised from the dead. Amen. I saw blind eyes open. I saw God do creative miracles. I saw children with brain damage healed, lame people walk, deaf ears open, miracles. And the greatest thing of all, we could start, plant 178 churches in unreached areas in spite of persecution. You know, I learned several things from that. First thing I learned, is that Jesus Christ is still alive. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he has not changed. The second thing I've learned is that the word of God is still true. This book that you and I hold in our hands, it is still true. Whenever it is preached, God is going to confirm it with signs, wonders, and miracles. I mean, he will confirm it for whoever believes in it. Thirdly, that the Holy Ghost who came down on the day of Pentecost is still here. Amen. Hallelujah. Put a demand on him and he will meet you. Put a demand on him. Say, Holy Spirit, I want you to be the same as you were in the book of Acts. He's still the book of Acts, Holy Ghost. Fourthly, the gospel message is still true. The gospel of the cross and the blood of Jesus. When we tell people how Jesus was whipped and bruised and beaten and crucified, bearing our sins, carrying our diseases, that gospel is still true and God still confirms that gospel message. Hallelujah. We are witnesses for Jesus. You shall receive power so that you can be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Remember, there's nothing that is impossible for God. For with God, nothing is impossible and all things are possible for him who believes. We have to take a hold of the horns of the altar and believe God. Believe God. Take him at his word and believe God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's bow our heads together. While your heads are bowed, I just want to ask one question. I know this is Saturday afternoon, but I'm asking if there's anyone here and you say, Pastor Christopher, I don't know whether I'm saved, but I need to make things right with God. I want to give my life to Jesus. If that is the condition of your soul, you want to make things right with God, let me see your hand so I know who you are, because I'd like to pray with you. Is there anybody? <laughs>